Okay, do we have um, any guests here tonight? Me. Yes. <laughs> All right, come right up here. You may come up and choose a book from off the table. We're glad you're here. <laughs> and Doreen brought her, but Doreen's up. Yeah. Okay, Doreen. You may come up and choose something from the table, too, since you brought a guest. Come on up. Doreen, since you brought a guest, you may come up and choose a book from off the table. All right. Okay, who drove the farthest? Let's start with 10 miles. Who drove 10 miles to be here? 10. Who drove 15? Skip did. Okay, Skip. Where is he? Skip. He's back in the back talking. <laughs> we'll catch him later, no problem. Skip? Skip, did you drive 15 miles? Huh? I came from work. Ah, you may come up and choose a book. <laughs> come on, Skip, come up and choose a book. From off the table. You drove the farthest. And we want to remind everybody that the grand prize is an audio Bible. That's what we are going to be giving out at the end. Okay, moving on. So to recap, what we've been talking about is we're working with a program called the New Start Program. And what does N stand for? We learned the other night that N stands for nutrition. And so E stands for what? What word does E stand for? Thank you. Lee, that's a good expression. It's exercise. How many of us love to do exercise? Raise your hand. Very good. I'm glad to see that because a lot of us don't want to do exercise. We don't want to make it a part of our program. So E is for exercise. And we do exercise because we want to make sure that we keep our bodies motivated, keep our bodies moving, keep our circulation going all the time. And... Um, it, it also is very helpful in keeping our bodies healthy. Like for instance, it, it fends off infection that may develop in your body. It also is very helpful for lowering the risk of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and colon cancer. So it's very effective that we would want to exercise and do it faithfully. Now you simply say, now come on. Here we are in the winter time. How can I do exercise in the winter time? Because all we think about is maybe going out on a spring walk or somewhere or fall. Well, we can do exercise in the winter time. We can walk in the winter time. We can walk inside our house by taking the steps up and down. We can walk, take the steps at work. We can also stationary walking can be a good exercise. Yes. Rocking chair. Hmm? The rocking chair. The rocking chair. Oh, oh, yes. For you, we'll provide the rocking chair, that's right. I know you love the rocking chair, you're right, that's right. So, thank you for sharing. So, a few facts about benefits of exercise. Number one, it can make us feel a lot happier. We did, our frame of mind is so much better. It can help with weight loss. It can help with our muscles and our bones. It can increase our energy level for some of us who feel like they're not really being very enthusiastic and we can maybe do some exercises and maybe want our bodies and help our bodies to maybe do a little more effectively. Um, it reduces our chronic disease. It helps with skin care. Your skin is a lot healthier if you exercise. And it helps with the brain and the memory, Warren. It helps with the brain and the memory if we exercise and keeps us keeps us thinking straight. So, um, a couple of things that we want to share a little bit here before, before we close is, um, a, what is a good time to do exercise? After breakfast, after lunch, and after supper. It's a good time to do it. Um, if you're here, how am I gonna get all that done? Well, even if you wanted to build up a time, you could do maybe five minutes every day for the first week, 10 minutes every day for the second week, or 15 minutes 
every day for the third week till your body gets motivated into doing it. Or you can do it three time, five minutes, three times a day, which would give you the 15 minutes that you want to do. Um, you, if you think, well, I'd like to lift some weights, well, go to, the, go to your pantry, pull up some canned goods, put them in your hands, and just move them up and down, just like this, or this way, or this way, or this way. Any way is gonna develop your bones and be able to um, make, them, make them stronger. So a couple of things that Mrs. White has to say about in exercising is this. Um, moderate exercise every day will impart strength to the muscles, which, which without exercise become flabby and enfeebled. By active exercise in the open air every day, the liver and the kidneys and the lungs will also be strengthened to perform their work. And that is very effective. If we just do a little bit of exercise every day, you will feel so much better. So, everybody stand up. Let's do a little bit of exercise before we continue our program. Yeah. Warren, I want you to, what you want to see you stand. That's right. Okay, come on. That's good. That's good. Okay. All right. Let's lift up our hands up and bring them down just like this to the side. Like this. One, two, three, four, five. Down by your side. Now move your legs up and down as if you're walking, but stationary. Stationary, Warren, stationary. <laughs> Very good. All right, now keep walking and then bring your hands up and move them in like this, like you see me doing. Keep walking. Just keep walking. All right, thank you very much. Y'all can be seated. Well, we've been... Uh, We've been having questions and answers. The first night we had questions come from us because it was the first night and you didn't have an opportunity to put questions in. But if you look in the pew in front of you, there should be little cards. One side says connect and the other side has a spot on it that says my questions. So as we go through our study tonight, make sure to write down a question that we can try to answer on Thursday night. We only have one question tonight, but we'll go ahead and ask it. I'm going to ask it to Pastor James, and he's going to try his best to answer this question from the Word. So the question is this. You mentioned being born with a sinful nature. Does that mean that babies are considered guilty when they're born? Wow. To answer this question, we have to go to the Word of God, especially in the book of Psalms 51 about verse 5 when David was speaking, Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Yes, it is true, a child is born with a sinful nature, but they are not born sinning. They are not born lost. They may be born in a lost condition, should I say, but they are not born condemned. Do I make sense? Because it is when the choice is put to use, it is when the child is known right from wrong, that God can actually uh, pass a judgment on that on that child, and we can go but as far as to say, even when you look at, for example, the Roman Catholic Church system, they have infant baptism because it is the idea of that universal sin. A child is born and he's already lost, and if you don't baptize them as soon as they're born, you know they go into hell. That's not biblical because a child must have the ability to choose from right and wrong. Because when a child is a little baby, what does he know? God does not work in this way. Another verse also that we can also learn from is in Exodus chapter 20 to answer that all the world are born sinful, but we are not born sinning. It is when we choose to sin against God after we have a knowledge of his will. This is when um, we are under the condemnation. It says in the book of Exodus chapter 20 about verse... Five, it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, referring to graven images, the second commandment, the third commandment. And I, the Lord, I am, I am I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. So there is God saying, I will visit the iniquity upon the children. Sometimes most people stop right there. Because if you read the next verse, he explains it. And he said, at the same time, he's going to show mercy. 
of unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. So even the child, while it is true, God can visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, but if the child himself accept God's mercy and grace, he's also escaped from the condemnation of sin. Yeah. Good, thank you for that answer. That's all we have for tonight. If you have other questions, put them down on the sheet. There's a little basket on the table in the back that you can put those in, and we'll do our best to answer those questions. At this time, we'll have our theme song uh, let out by Jim Newman. Good evening, folks. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we sing more about Jesus. And we sing all four stanzas. study guide together. Before we do, I want to tell a little story from this summer, or actually from this winter, and uh, then we'll get into the word, okay? Mm -hmm. This um, story is about a young lady who came this summer, and then she came back this winter to spend time with our family, and while she was here, uh, where she's from, they have a hard time getting dental work done for her. Mm. So while she was here, we have uh, an acquaintance who's becoming a friend who offered to do some dental work for free for her some surgical type dental work wow. and um, so this was being planned while she was gone and then when she came for the Christmas time uh, we went when well, my wife went to the uh, dentist with with her and she sat in that seat and they were ready to inject her with some Novocaine to numb her up and uh, to, to start a little bit of work in, in her teeth she was so paralyzed with fear about having anything to do with the dentist that she just she could not go through with even the very first step. In where she's from, apparently 
they don't use Novocaine or numbing mm -hmm. agents. Wow. And she's had a extreme horrible experiences with the dentist. Mm -hmm. Even though this dentist is very gentle, he's got the right medication to make it so that she could probably, if she knew better, she could probably just, you know, be reading a magazine or something while he's doing the work, maybe feeling a little vibration, but no pain. But she didn't know that. And she was so paralyzed with fear that she couldn't receive the help that she needed from the dentist wow. because she had a misunderstanding of the dentist's abilities. <laughs> In the same way, many times we mm -hmm. cannot have the same interaction with God that He would like us to have because we have misconceptions about His power, misconceptions about His love towards us. And we're going to be talking tonight about how much he loves us and how he saved us and why he saved us and how he's working to fix us and hopefully we can see a good picture of God and say, ah, I can trust God. Amen. I can trust what he's doing. I can put my, like this girl, I can put my mouth mm -hmm. in his hands as he puts his hands in my mouth. <laughs> we can put our heart in yes. God's hands Amen. as well. So let's pray and then we'll get into number one in our study guide. God, this evening, we want to know the truth. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to have misconceptions. We don't want to have fear. We want to be intelligent. We want to be able to reason with our God-given reasoning about our salvation, about our souls, about our future. So we ask you to give us your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth, baptize us with your Holy Spirit. I pray especially for Pastor James and for myself that you speak through us, Lord. I pray for all of us that we would hear the words that you would speak through your Bible, through your scriptures, and that we would all be changed by what we read, by what we hear, by the power of your creative word. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let's get right into it to number one. So if you have your study guide, you can follow along. And we're going to be looking at God's love. love. Our study tonight is the love of God. So number one is, whom did God so love that he sent his son to be their savior? John 3.16. Let's turn to John 3.16. Most of you probably already know this verse. It's a very familiar verse to many. We'll turn right to it. John 3.16. The question is, whom did God love? Whom did God love? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What do you have to say about that, Pastor? Well, God loves the world. And that includes you and me. Every single one of us. There, We don't deserve God's love. We cannot earn it. But he loves us anyhow. <laughs> and this is good news to start off with. God loves us. It's not because we love him. It is because he loves us. He took the initiative, didn't he? So now, to go to question number two. What reason did Paul give why God's redeemed sinners in Christ? What reason did Paul give why God redeemed sinners in Christ? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And I read. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about this verse, Pastor Tom? So we're hearing here God's mercy and his love. And again, we hear that God is taking, taking the initiative. He's the one who says, these people are sinners. These people are lost. I will do something about it because I love them. Same wow. thing we read in John 3.16. God loves you. He is, That's rich. Why he, he is rich in mercy. Mm -hmm. Wow. That reminds me of a, a, a Bible verse. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is for the Lord's mercies that we are not, not consumed. consumed. Lamentation 3, 23. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Number three. According to the text in Titus 3, 3 through 5, why did God save us? Same question again and again. Why did God, God save, save us? us? Titus 3, 3 through 5. That's in the T section of your Bible. Mm-hmm. In the New Testament there. Second Timothy. Yep. Okay, Titus 3, 3 through 5. And 3 through 5 reads, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Paul is talking about Christians here. Yeah. This is how we once were, he says. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us mm. through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what will be the ans- our answer today? Well, according to this text, why did God save us? Because of his mercy. It's not because of works of righteousness, which we have done. There is, that means you didn't do anything good <laughs> for God to love you. Mm. To give his son to die for you. I have not done anything good. As a matter of fact, I've done the opposite of anything right. But God loves us in spite of all the wrongs we've done. And that's why he gave Jesus. To save us from our sins. That's according to his mercy. So now let's go to question number four. In the time of Christ, what were the people being taught? In the time of Christ, what were the people being taught? Matthew chapter 5, verses 43. Verse 43. The word of God says, You have heard that he have been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, it's pretty simple there. I don't know we need to make too many <laughs> comments on that. The people in that time were being taught... Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Hate your enemy. That was the teaching of the day. That's mm-hmm. what Jesus was. He was counter, <laughs> contradicting, counteracting that teaching. And we'll read about that in the next verse. So let's go on to that. Same place in scripture. Next verse. The question is, in contrast to this human love, mm-hmm. how did Jesus describe Christian love? Wow. And that's in verse 44. It says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Mm. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now that's quite different than the teaching of the day. And really we have that teaching a lot in this day too, don't we? Yes, we uh, people saying, well, you know, just brush people off. And it's easy to do sometimes. If, if somebody does something against you, uh, either forget about them mm. or do something back, pay back. And that's what's also amazing about God's love because... God didn't come, didn't give his son for his friends or, you know, people who loves him for good people. But rather he gave his son for his enemies. And we will see this as we continue to study. That's right. That's what we, that's what we looked at last week too, on Thursday, that while we were still sinners, while we were weak, while we were helpless, uh, even while we were enemies, Romans, was it 5? Mm-hmm. Uh, 5, 8. 8 through mm-hmm. 10, 6 mm-hmm. through 10. Said that while we're still enemies, Christ died for us. Yeah. yeah. All right. Question number six. How far reaching? How far reaching is God's love? Matthew five forty five. And it reads, "That you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, for He maketh His sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust." So how far-reaching is God's love? Just and unjust. So wow. Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor but hate your enemy. But Jesus is saying here, but look what God does. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, on the just and the unjust, on everybody he sends these things. You know, when we accept him, there's so much more, mm. so many more gifts that we can receive. Just like this little girl that came, if she could have accepted the dental work, mm. she could have received greater gifts from the dentist. Yeah. He was already kind to her, already gentle to her, already ready to provide for her. But until, in the same way, God is doing that for us. But when we receive him and accept him and surrender to him, 
He is ready to lavish so much more on us than just the sunshine and the rain. So are you saying that even though a person may not be a Christian or living the right life, God still loved that person? Apparently so, don't you think? So the, the murderer, the fornicator, the liar, the club goer, the, the well, drug addict, are you talking about them too? Yes, isn't that what we just read in, uh, in was it Titus, that we were, what was it, foolish, that we were... Uh, oh, loving yeah. ourselves. So we were once in that condition ourselves. And thank God he loved us anyway. How easy is it for us to forget that? It's only by God's love that we're really drawn to him anyway. Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. He's making the initiative Amen. for you. Amen. The only reason you're sitting in here tonight is because God is drawing you. Maybe not because of a, a pamphlet that you received or a friend that brought you. God is working in your life to bring you to Him, yes, to draw yes. Him, to teach you the truth about the way things are in the world, the way things are in His kingdom. In the study guide, I want to read this excerpt right under question number six. God's love extends beyond all barriers. It is the opposite of human love. God even loves and, care, and cares for those who hate Him. God's love is therefore unconditional. It doesn't depend on our goodness. That speaks for itself. Yeah, it does. Are you guys hearing that tonight? God loves you, no matter if you love Him back or not. <laughs> maybe like some of you that have children, maybe that have gone away from you. Yeah. And you can say, you know, my son or my daughter is not calling me right <laughs> now. They're angry at me right now. Yeah. They're really rebelling against me. But you don't stop loving them. <laughs> no. You may not be able to talk to them the way that you normally would like to talk to them. But you don't stop loving them in the same way. Even more so, God loves us. Even mm -hmm. when we are not talking to Him. When we're not spending time with Him. When we're, not, when we're even rebelling against Him. He still loves us. And He's doing His best to draw us. But He's also a gentleman. Yes, he and is. He'll never force Himself on anyone that's not His character. You know, one, one thing that came to mind... Coming from Isaiah 43, verse 4. The Bible says, Since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. And therefore will I give men for thee, and the people for thy life. Hmm. Based on this verse, God is saying, you are precious. You are very valuable in my eyes. And he says, I've loved you, and this has nothing to do with your goodness. I just do. Mm -hmm. And it's a love that you and I can never fully understand. No matter how far we search it, we can come to church and keep Sabbath every day as far as God's concerned. The love of God is unspeakable. Unspeakable. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Let's move on to the next, next question. Number seven. I guess I got a little ahead of myself here with Romans 5. Uh, but that's okay. Let's go there now to Romans 5, 6 through 10. The question mm -hmm. is, what four conditions were we still in? Mm -hmm. This is past tense, and we'll see this in the, in the text. Were we still in when God redeemed us in Christ? Romans 5, 6 through 10. Romans 5, 6 to 10. Romans 5, 6 through 10. Let's follow along here. Mm -hmm. Starting in verse 6, it says, For when we were, this is past tense, when we were still without strength, mm -hmm. in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Oh, There's the second one. Mm -hmm. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Mm. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love mm -hmm. toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies... Hmm. We were reconciled to God. All past tense, you hear that? Yeah. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by, by His life. life. So now, what for condition were we still mm -hmm. in when God redeemed us in Christ? Number one, we were without strength. Number two, we were ungodly. Hmm. Number three, we were sinners. It still are. And number four, we were enemies of God. No wonder then that we can love our enemy because we being an enemy to God have been loved by Him. Hmm. Amen. 
Amen. Question number eight. How many times does the Bible, does the word love, appear in the following passage? John chapter 21, 15 to 17. We can read it right from, the, from our study guide. It says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep, tend my lamb. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. He said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, You know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Did you count seven? How many times? All right. Let's make a commentary on this <laughs> verse because we don't really see this in English. No. We just read love, 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 love. Mm -hmm. But when you read it in the Greek, and you can see here there are two words that are in parentheses yeah. uh, beside love. One is agapao, which we get our word agape, which we, we use that word agape. The other one is phileo, phileo, where we get our the name of our city, Philadelphia. Kind of love than phileo love. So Peter is, uh, Jesus is asking Peter, do you agape love me? But Peter has to reply. He's, just remember, he's, he's denied that he knew Christ three times, just a few days before. And he's asking, Jesus is asking, do you phileo love me? Or mm -hmm. excuse me, do you, do you agape love me? This is God's unconditional love. Do you, do you love me with an unconditional love, Peter? But Peter was forced to answer, Lord, I, I phileo you. I love you more like a brother. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't bring himself to say. He, he had to be honest. Yes. I can't say, Lord, that I love you, love you unconditionally. Yeah. And then the second time Jesus asked, Peter, do you, fillet, or do you agape love me? And Peter had to reply again, Lord, I fillet love you. Imagine his, his spirit kind of being crushed just because of his own inadequacy to be able to say that Earlier, remember, Jesus said, uh, can you drink the cup that I drink? Or, you know, Jesus, yeah. uh, Peter said, I, I will, I will I'll go to death with you, Jesus. He whipped out his sword when they came to take Jesus and yeah. cut off that guy's ear, right? Now he's in a position of humility where he can't even say, Lord, I, I love you so much. He can't say that anymore. Wow. So the third time Jesus asked, do you love me? He says, do you phileo me? Peter wasn't as stressed out, as, as broken that Jesus asked him three times if he loved him. Mm. He was upset because the third time Jesus didn't even ask him, do you agape love me? Wow. Simply do you flay on me? Peter came to a realization that he was, had an inadequate love. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth for all of us. We all have an inadequate love. Mm -hmm. That's why we must have the love of God. That's why we have the gift of his love upon us. Yes. His love is an agape love, an unconditional love for us, which Peter couldn't say couldn't that say he it. had. Couldn't truthfully, say truthfully couldn't say that he had. Yeah, couldn't say okay. That love we have to have for our neighbor, that's me, you know, cheap, you know, take care of my another mm -hmm. I have, you know, it can be black, white, yellow, like you say, you know. And yes. The same one, they can Sure, absolutely. That wasn't just for Peter, was it? It's for everyone. We have to love, we have to love, okay? God love, because God love, that's not, we cannot express. We don't have words to say how great is this love. We uh, must have God's love. If, if we don't have God's love, then it's a selective love. Yeah. You can love your brother and hate your enemy yeah. with a, with a filet of love. You can love somebody when they're treating you well and then forget about them when they don't treat you well. But yeah. God's love, his agape love, will always...
always be with us. That's why it's called in, in other places his never failing love. Or his, um, what's another one? Um, um, it's unspeakable. His love endures forever, it says in another place in scripture. Anyway, we better keep moving here. Number, Number nine. nine. Okay, according to the prophet Jeremiah, what draws us to God? Let's go to the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 3. Jeremiah 31, 3. We already quoted from Jesus saying, No one comes to me unless the Father draws him. Now let's see what the Old Testament says. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. It says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. There's a good one, everlasting love. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. So what draws us, according to Jeremiah? His everlasting love, his loving kindness. And it's everlasting. It has no end. It also has no beginning. Mm -hmm. That's the love that the Lord loves you and I with. Does that make you feel good tonight? Yeah. To be loved with a love that never fails? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Praise God. You know, someone once said, you know, there is nothing you can do to make God love you any less. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you any more. Hmm. That's good. Hmm. Sometimes we might think about one, but not the other. God's love is, as some call, unconditional. It's, it's not exactly based on a condition. Of course, we can just add to that when we receive his love, mm -hmm. there's so much more <laughs> that we can get from that. Yes. But he's not going to love us less. What if we don't love him back? That's mm -hmm. not his way. That's mm -hmm. not his love. All right, let, let, let me read this excerpt here. Most people are running away from God because they think he is out to punish them. But the truth is, God loves us unconditionally and gave us his only son so that none should be lost. This is what draws us to God. It is the goodness of God mm -hmm. that leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Question number 10. What endearing term does God use for his people? First okay. John 3, verses 1 and 2. What endearing term does God use to describe his people? The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because he knew him not. Hmm. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hmm, very good. This really brings home our point that we were just talking about. God loves everybody. He sends the sun to everybody. He sends the rain to everybody. Yeah. But those who receive his love receive sonship and daughtership into his family. That's right. uh, and, and the world doesn't receive that. People who don't receive him don't receive that. We can read it here in verse mm -hmm. 1 again. Therefore the world does not know us because it does not know him. There's a, there's a difference between the, the children of God, the people who have accepted his love, and the people of the world, the people who haven't. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love everybody. It doesn't mean that he didn't send Jesus for everybody. It doesn't mean that he's not working and drawing everybody, everybody. Mm -hmm. but only those who accept his love and receive him can receive that gift of salvation, can receive that gift of sonship and daughtership into his family. Amen. So there's a difference there. And we want that. Don't we want that in our lives? Are you, are you hearing tonight that God loves you? <laughs> I hope at least you're hearing that. Yeah. Are you hearing tonight that, that he's the one who's taking the initiative to draw you to himself, that he's the one who's pouring out his loving kindness towards you. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be afraid of God. We don't have to be afraid of, of, his, of his godliness. There's a healthy respect that we have for him because he is God and he is all-powerful. But along with that, all-powerful comes all-loving yes. as well. Yes, a is. tender, everlasting love. Yes, it is. Okay, are we on number 11? 11. Good, thank you. In what should we humans rely for our salvation? In uh, what should we rely? On what should we rely for our salvation? First John 4, 16. First John 4, 16. Mm. And it says, And we have known and believed the love of God uh, that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. How would you interpret that for our question? We must dwell in God's love. Hmm. What's that mean? 
Meaning, uh, you continue in that love. It is not once and done. Mm -hmm. You have to abide in it. That means you have to remain in it to experience the fullness of God's love. Mm -hmm. And that's what we must do. All you spouses out there, who knows that you need to abide or remain in that love with your spouse? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or else what happens, this distance starts to come and yeah. maybe you have to say, well, we better have a date or we better you know, do some, some hugging, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hold hands tonight. Let's yes. talk tonight, right? right? Because if we don't abide or remain in that love, yeah. we become distant. We become disconnected. Yeah. Very good mm -hmm. answer. Um, only, only we know and believe God that God's love for us is unconditional. We can rely on Him for the assurance of salvation. His love for us never fails. Mm -hmm. Question number 12. What does the knowledge of God's perfect love cast out? Mm -hmm. First John 4, 17 and 18. The Word of God says, Hearing is our love made perfect, that we have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How would you answer this question? Uh, simply put, fear of judgment. <laughs> you know, that's probably the, the one thing that people are most afraid of. I, I've felt that way for a long time, and even sometimes it comes back to me, that fear. Of the judgment day. Yeah. The judgment day. But if we're in Christ, and we'll get more into this as we go through the studies, if we're in Christ, we will not be judged. Mm -hmm. We can read that specifically in Romans. Yeah. But we, we've been released from judgment. Mm -hmm. And that Christ has taken our judgment for us. We don't have to be afraid of judgment. Mm -hmm. God loved us enough to give us His own Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. He's drawn us to Himself. And then he's placed that judgment on his son. And now we've been set free from that judgment. We don't have to fear the judgment. The judgment is in our favor. Absolutely. It's like being the person who receives the, the judgment in a positive. You want that judgment. You want that verdict. We are accepted in the kingdom. We are citizens of the eternal kingdom. We're citizens of the eternal kingdom. Amen. Yeah, and that means we, we are, you know... Out of the earth. That's right. Because we pass through it already. Yeah. Already. Absolutely. Let's look at uh, number 13. This is our last question before we go into some comments mm -hmm. uh, on the rest of the study. So, what are the 10 things Paul mentions that cannot separate us from the love of God? Let's go to Romans 8 38. I love Paul sometimes. He's, he seems so eccentric sometimes. He says, that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And here he just gives us this list of this list of that nothing can separate us from the love of God. So let's read it tonight. 8 verses 30, where are we, 38 and 39? Yes, yeah. good. 8, 38, 39. Follow along here. Try to write them down if you're, if you're writing. It says, For I am persuaded mm -hmm. that neither death, One. nor life, Two. Nor angels, Three. nor principalities, Four. nor powers, Five. nor things present, Six. nor things to come, Seven. Uh, nor height, <laughs> nor depth, Ten. nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Any Amen. comments on that, or is that sufficient? Uh, uh, to, to say the least is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Not even yourself? Hmm. That's a good one. That's a good one. But I can tell you what. Your choice can separate you from God's love. Mm. Our choice can separate us from God's love. Because like you said earlier, God is a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And this is why it says in Romans, I mean, Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's such a gentleman, he will knock at the door. He doesn't just open up and say, let me Only in. Only those he who has open, he'll come in. Only when you open up, he will come in and sup with you. But except we open up our hearts and let Jesus in, he's not coming inside of our hearts. It is when we say, yes, Lord, you're welcome. Have a seat. Make yourself at home. This is when the Lord can truly come and dwell and live in our hearts. So God may still love us, but by our own choice, we could be separated from his love. Separated from his love. His unconditional love never fails. He'll continue to love you forever. Mm -hmm. But 
Beside our choice, nothing else can separate us. If we don't accept that love and connect ourselves with that love through His His grace, yeah, then we can be separated. But only by our choice. Yeah. In the back. The evil angels, yes. That's right. That's right. From the evil angels, sure. Wow. Nothing, nothing can separate us. And God, I like the way you said it, keeps us away from those things. Let me read this excerpt. As Christian, we may have to face many hardships in this world. But our joy and peace and hope come from knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. There will never come a time when God will stop loving us because His love is unconditional and everlasting. This love manifested in Christ and Him crucified is our eternal hope. Mm. Amen. Hey, amen. Let's move into the next section here. It's not question and answer. There's some commentary about some historical um, information about the Greek language, about love, and about the concept that we have that's been handed down to us through the ages about love. So you want to start out, Pastor James, with the first part here, how God's love has, uh, uh, was perverted? Yeah, God's love was perverted over time, especially during the early translation of the Bible. Um, the author make mention of the fact, when you look at in the, in the back of your study guide, in the first paragraph, it mentioned the second paragraph. It talks about it was Augustine. Who began to move away from the agape love into what is called um, the caritas love. Caritas love. It is the love where man is seeking to love God rather than man experiencing the love of God for himself. It's like a big difference. It is one thing I'm trying to love God by my own power. It's another thing that God is loving me. And there's a big difference in that. Now I want to read this excerpt. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's our human nature to want to say, especially when it comes to something like this that's a free gift. And Paul tried to pound this into us. We're saved by grace through faith, not yeah. of works. Yeah. That it's, it's natural for us to say, what's my part to play? Yeah. What am I supposed to do? Where do I fit in? Me, 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 me. Yeah. <laughs> and so Augustine and others grappled with this as well. Mm -hmm. And Augustine came up with a, a ha kind of half and half solution. Okay, yeah. here's your part to your salvation. And I won't try to steal from you here, but uh, that's why uh, this is where, where some believe that you're saved by grace and, and works. works. Not yeah. grace that works. Now, God works out His grace through us. Yeah. But that's different than us being saved by God's grace plus yeah. our works. And we'll see that here as, as you go. I've also, also heard a, a different ter terminology that goes along with that. It's called infused righteousness. Infused. It is the idea that, okay, there is the justification of God, which is perfect. And there is my little bit of work. And I call that sanctification. But I'm going to blend those two together. And that's called infused righteousness. And that's the teaching that actually led many people into the dark ages. Mm. This is the false idea that I have to do self-flagellation. And I have to practice how many Hail Mary. So that in my goodness, I can please God. Mm. And that was very dangerous. Now, and it's also connected to this false idea of God's love also. If we think right after the dark ages or at the end of the dark ages, when Martin Luther himself was... Climbing up those stairs on his yes. knees and praying, and, and he had flagellated himself, and he had had sleepless nights, and he was trying his best to take his his pittance of righteousness, mm -hmm. and, and and somehow have it be worthy enough for him to be saved, mm -hmm. uh, con connected with the righteousness of God. That finally the verse came to his mind: "The just shall, shall live, live by, by faith. faith, by faith." Mm -hmm. And it, the light bulb came on. Yeah. But there's there's been a lot of of perversion to God's love and yeah. to his salvation to try to put man somehow insert ourselves in there. Yeah. So go ahead, go ahead now. Go I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this, uh, this excerpt from the bottom, from the, from the box that we have at the bottom. It says human loves is God loves God. Agape love is look at human love. Human love is conditional. It depends on the beauty and goodness. Therefore needs arousing. 
No wonder why a lot of marriages are failing. As, as, as soon as you start looking so good, that's the end of it. <laughs> now, the next one is <laughs> the human love also goes, it is changeable. It's changeable. It fluctuates and is unreliable. Consider the divorce rate in the United States today. And the third point of human love, it is self-centered or self-seeking. It is egocentric and therefore always wants to climb socially, politically, academically, e economically, and also religiously. That's human love. Let's look at God's love to see the big difference. Mm -hmm. God's agape love is unconditional. It's spontaneous, un uncaused, and independent of our goodness. God's love is changeless or immutable, is everlasting, and never ceases. God's love is self in seeing, is selfless, is therefore will step down from the benefit of others, is other centered love. This is the love that God has in contrast to human love. Now just visualize with us, if you will, for a moment, Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit up in heaven ruling the universe. Jesus decides that he's going to be the one to come down to earth. The angels know that God is good, while the two-thirds that remain. Mm -hmm. The angels knew that God is good. But when they saw Jesus come down to earth, they said, wow, this is a bigger picture of God's goodness than we knew before. Yeah. When they saw Jesus walk on the dirty streets and touch the sin, uh, the sin-ridden, mm -hmm. diseased carcass, yeah, not carcass yet, but you know, death-infested bodies of, of uh, yeah. people with leprosy, they said to themselves, wow, this is a grander picture of how God is loved than we ever realized before. Yeah. When Jesus allowed himself to be whipped and punched and beaten and thorns put on his head and put on the cross and the whole time all he could say was, Father, forgive, forgive them, them for they know not what they do. They were blown away. I'm imagining they were blown away to say, wow, we knew that God was good before. Yeah. We already knew, we, we, we decided to stay with God when Lucifer accused him. Yeah. But this is way beyond what we realized our God is. Yeah. Yeah. And they have seen the agape love from yeah. the standpoint of heaven. And the question is, do we see that love? Mm. Have we seen it? Are we experiencing that love? We've got to. <laughs> We've got to experience that love. We've got to see that in our lives. Yeah. No, nowhere else has God manifested his love in this way. No. He, his son didn't die anywhere else but on this earth. For us, little grain of sand, are we? And yet, the Lord manifested His love here, nowhere else. Boy, I feel special. I don't know about we're, you. We're not special. <laughs> very privileged. I would like to talk about uh, on the very last page. Mm -hmm. There's a little table there that deals with three gospels, if you will. Even though mm -hmm. two of them aren't really gospels, the first one is the paganism, the 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 um, the phileo type of love, mm -hmm. which is basically. Man-centered yeah. and man-initiating. Mm -hmm. And this is every pagan religion comes from this kind of love. The kind of love where in order for the God, mm -hmm. whoever that God is, mm -hmm. to give you what you want or to do what you want, that you have to do something first. That's right. Maybe it's the rain dance. Yeah. Right? In order to get the rain. <laughs> maybe it's uh, maybe it's giving food offerings and burning incense to this God and then they'll give you prosperity or some sort of uh, you know um, you know the womb will be open. Yeah. Maybe it's um, sacrificing your child yeah. in, uh, in the fires of the altar mm -hmm. in the, in very paganistic religions. Whatever it is, this kind of religion, every pagan religion deals with man saying I want something in order to get it. I'm to going do, to, to do put the quarter in the gumball machine <laughs> and turn the knob and then my God will spit out whatever that thing is. Or maybe it's saying certain prayers and Jesus said, uh, don't be like the, the hypocrites, heathen. don't be like the heathens just repeating vain, with vain repetitions or much speaking. Think about uh, Mount Carmel with, um, mm -hmm. with Elisha, Elisha and with, with the Baal worshippers and how all day long they were dancing around cutting and they were themselves. yelling and screaming, cutting themselves and there was no God to answer. 
And then all Elisha had to do at the end of the day, after dumping barrel after barrel of water on top of this, this offering, was right. say a simple, right. humble prayer mm -hmm. in faith. God brought lightning down from heaven, struck that fire, consumed that water, consumed that sacrifice, consumed that wood, consumed the, even the, the stones of the altar to show his power. And it didn't take Elisha doing anything, putting any quarters in any machines, saying any sort of number of prayers a certain number of times a certain way. All he had to do was ask. Amen. Simply ask. That's the contrast between these two loves. So yeah. the pagan love is that, that we would have to give something or initiate something to God in order for Him to be happy with us. Mm -hmm. If you tonight are feeling like you're not good enough mm. for God to love you, if you're feeling like you're not doing the right things in order for God to love you, in order for God to give you what you need or what you want, please push those feelings aside. They're not real. They're not full of truth. They're a deception. And there's another danger also is if you think um, because you've done wrong, God stopped loving you. <laughs> That's not true. That's not how God's loves operate. Remember... There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more. Okay? There's nothing you can do to make Him love you any less. He loves you, and that's unconditional. And if we remember John, or not, uh, 1 John 1, 9, which mm -hmm. we ended with last, uh, last meeting, if we confess our, our sins, sins, He is, he is faithful. faithful. There is something that we do, but we don't take the initiative to do that. It's really His grace. Yeah. It's His Spirit that's convicting us in the first place. It's His grace that's giving us the desire to, right. to have a different yeah. lifestyle. It's, all, it's Him working through us the whole time. So let's look at the other, the other Gospels here, the, other, the, the right Gospel. The, the, the Eros Gospel, the mm -hmm. Gospel of, of, of falsehood, of paganism, is that we would take the initiative. Yep. The uh, other Gospel, this perverted Gospel that came out of the Dark Ages, is we do our part and God does His part. It's kind of like you meet Him halfway. You do your best, and, God does. and then God does the rest. Now there is something that we do, but we'll have to talk about that another night. Mm -hmm. Our part is not to come to God, or, or, or excuse me, <laughs> our part is not to, to do good works in order to meet God halfway with, with what we do. Our part is simply to surrender, and we'll talk more about that here in the near future. That's right. So this is perverted, it's a, it's a halfway gospel. And most of the Christian world is caught up right in that. And we have to be very, very careful. It's easy. It's, 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 it's human it's nature so, to say, so what so part so do so I have to play? Where do I fit in? What, mm -hmm. what do I do? And uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 4.10 puts it this way. That we must strive to enter into His rest. That's right. So our work is to remain in faith, remain in rest. In and another place says that anything that's done without Faith is it's sin. sin. So there's that faith piece. Jesus says in John 15, he says, abide in me. Yeah. That's what we're to do. We'll somebody to somebody once that said that, that faith is believing in something that someone else did for you. Hmm. In this case, it would be. One. <laughs> so the final love here in our, in our chart is, is God's agape love. It's the agape gospel. It's the gospel mm -hmm. that we've been studying tonight in the scriptures the gospel Sorry. that says, I have drawn you. I, I have, have loved, loved you, you with an everlasting love. With love and kindness, I have drawn you. And this is all throughout scripture. Sorry. And in that case, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, he did this. Maybe tonight you feel like you're too much of a sinner. Maybe you feel like you've done things to be an enemy to God. Maybe you feel like you're not good enough for some reason. It doesn't matter how bad you are. God can handle it. God's big enough. It's about how good God is. He, he's not just physically big enough. His character is big enough. His heart is big enough. Mm. He can handle you. Mm. He can take care of your issues. Yes, he can. You can't hurt him enough that he will walk away from you. Nice. Now, do we intentionally hurt him? No. No, of course not. We don't because we love him, because he first loved us. May I read this excerpt here? Under the agape gospel, we are saved by grace alone, and this grace is received by faith alone. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Good works motivate by God's agape love for us are the fruit of the Spirit. While glorifying God, these works do not 
contribute one iota to our salvation. Rather, their evidence, they evidence the salvation that is already ours in Christ. Very good. So how do you know then, according to that, how do you know if you're abiding in Christ or if you're connected with Christ, if His love is being manifested in your life? Receive it. You, rec you see it by? By faith. The evidence of by the your fruit, actions. By the yes. life, by the life you live. That's right. So we, we're not saved because of our works. But once we are saved, the fruit comes out. Those works come out. Jesus says, by their fruit, you shall know them. You shall know them. And you can know yourself, too, by your fruit. That's right. So let's end with this question here. It's the last question. It's the response question. It's for you tonight. And I hope that you hear this. And it's a simple question. Do you believe that God's agape love for you mm -hmm. is unconditional. And that is why He saved you in Christ. Even though you are a sinner who has failed to perfectly keep His law. Mm. Do you believe that? If so, put a yes down there on that sheet of paper. I'd also invite you, if you would like to, to take out the, the little response card in front of you. If there's one in your pew there. And... Uh, also put on there, if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now tonight, that means specifically, not just that He is God of the universe, and not just that He died on the cross for you, which He has and He is, mm -hmm. but that you want to say, Jesus, I want you to be the person who loves me unconditionally, personally. That's right. You want Him to be your Lord and Savior in that way, to be the lover of your soul conditionally. There's also a spot on there for baptism. If you want to be baptized. And the third one, somebody help me out. What's the third one there? Your response? How are you going to. What's the question say? I don't have it in front of me. Learn more on this topic. If you want to learn more on this topic, specifically mm -hmm. the topic of God's unconditional love, you can mark that down. And please put on the line there God's unconditional love. So when we see that response card, we'll know what that means. All right. And if you will have any questions, on this study, you can also fill out this little card and mm -hmm. put it in the box and we'll deal with that on Thursday when we meet again. That's right. There's a basket in the back and the Q&A time at the beginning of our meeting on Thursday. We'll answer those questions. That's it for tonight. We have refreshments in the back and uh, a fellowship. We may not want to stay too long. I don't know what it looks like out there. I think snow is coming. But uh, Pastor James, would you bless us with a word of prayer asking specifically that the Lord would soften our hearts That's right. to His love. All right, let us pray. Let us pray to close. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank You for allowing us to be in Your house of worship. Father, we could be anywhere. Mm. Some of us could be at home watching television. Could be out and about just running some errand. Some of us could just be at work or in many different places. But Lord, for some reason, You brought us into Your house of worship. We thank You, Lord, for this love. Even though we don't understand it, we're reading about it. We're studying about it. Lord, we still don't get it. Mm -hmm. We simply pray that you will soften our hearts. Yeah. You will open our minds that we can begin to grasp in the smallest sense what it means to be loved by you. And let this love initiate, motivate, govern, energize our lives. Lead us to repentance and obedience. Father, bless each one of us that are gathered here today. Bring us back home safely, Lord, yes. we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Praise God. God's willing, we'll see you again next, this Thursday, mm -hmm. 7 o'clock. God bless you.